Looks like we're about ready to get started. All right, uh, so everybody thank Jerry for donating his laptop to uh, the presentation because mine doesn't work, so thank you, Jerry. Yay. All right, guys, uh, welcome to the first talk in the React track at ConnectJS. Uh, I'm excited to be kicking it off. My name is Taggart Bongatti. I'm the founder of uh, the pretty new uh, React ATL meetup. We've had... Uh, Three meetings so far, myself and my co-organizer, Andrew, who's giving the Flux talk directly after me. Um, we have our fourth one coming up on Tuesday, and uh, our speaker is Tim Dorr, who was recently added to the RACT team, which maintains uh, Redux, which is a really popular Flux library, and the React router, which is used in a huge number of React apps. Um, so he has a lot of good insight into uh, how React works, how the, how the uh, community kind of drives development. Um, so if you want to see him speak, it'll be on Tuesday at General Assembly. All right, so where did React come from? Uh, it, Facebook built it out of necessity. Uh, they kind of, as they were working, they, they were building their own PHP abstractions and they kind of saw, all right, we need a, a more markup-like syntax that's very declarative, and that's where uh, one of the pieces, JSX, that we'll be talking about today came from. That was out of, out of their uh, hip-hop library. And all of these different pieces kind of originated in all of these different projects that Facebook was working on, and eventually they said, all right, maybe we can put some of this together into something a little more concrete that we can share with the world, so that's where React came from. Uh, so it's been around for a few years now. Um, they're very community driven, which is, I think, one of the most important parts about React and one of the things that makes it so popular and so widely used is the fact that everyone can, can really have a say in the way uh, React develops. They move very quickly, they're always looking to the future, uh, you'll see some examples of that. If you've never coded in ES6 before, uh, you're going to get a, a slight crash course because now that is officially how you are supposed to be writing React. Um, so, you know, a lot of people writing Angular are, are still writing it because they have all, you know, they have to maintain all this backwards compatibility. React kind of throws a lot of that out the window and says we're going to think about the future. Um, and it really simplifies the UI development process. I, I hope through this uh, introductory talk I can share some of the methodologies that uh, kind of hopefully make that apparent. So what is it? A lot of people, have you, who's heard the term it's the V and MVC when, when people talk about React? Yeah, a, a good number of you. I, I think that's, um, that's not giving React enough credit uh, for what it is. It is definitely more than just a piece of a larger puzzle. It's, a, it's a, a wider methodology towards building UIs. Um, one of the, the biggest uh, comparisons people make is to web components or Polymer. Um, that, that's not really fully telling of what React is. Web components and Polymer are very tied to the DOM. They're about building for a browser that supports web components. React is actually completely DOM agnostic. You do not have to build React apps for a web browser. Um, they just made a, a huge push in this most recent release to actually strip out all of the DOM manipulation library part of React and make it its own library called React DOM. So now you can write your, your same React components and you can work on rendering them to Android, or iOS, or a native desktop app, or Canvas, or uh, an SVG renderer that's not uh, a browser, so or just a plain string. So it's uh, React is really a level above uh, just view libraries that, that you would see in MVC. Um, and it, it really simplifies UI state, which is kind of their whole bread and butter, is 
taking the state of your app and saying, all right, how can we make this easy to reason about? Uh, and they do this with a virtual DOM, which is uh, an in-memory representation of the DOM. So we'll get into that a little bit, but what, all you really need to know now is it is not treating the DOM as the source of truth. It's never, if you're writing React correctly, you're never going to, to go do a node or an element lookup and say, what's the value of that so that I know how to do this computation? It's all in memory. It's all in JavaScript. The DOM is just the final presentation point. Um, so let's define some terms so that we're all on the same page uh, throughout this discussion. Uh, state is the data that defines your system's output at any time. Uh, and you can really describe it much more in human English. It's the state of your application at any point in time. But, but that's the important thing. It's the function of time and your data. Declarative programming is describing what to do uh, when the data is in different states. Uh, a lot of times that means leaving the implementation up to a library. Um, so there are also functional languages, and a lot of people don't like uh, describing any JavaScript library as functional or declarative because uh, it's, it's not really pure. Um, but React does a good job of taking those methodologies and really having a declarative way to write your code, which we'll see some examples of. In contrast, imperative programming is uh, describing how to achieve that declaration. So obviously, when, when you're writing, you're, you're going to have to say sometimes, you know, go make that orange with this method. That's imperative programming. But if you can coordinate it off correctly, you can still program declaratively. Um, functional programming is building functions that mutate data to achieve a declared state. And uh, these are all building block functions. So when you're programming functionally, you're writing different functions that, that can work together, that you can build them off of each other build them together. A lot of times when people talk about functional programming, they're talking about a certain class of functions like map, reduce, filter. Uh, has anyone used lodash or underscore? Um, that, that library is, is really very heavily functional. Um, and reactive programming, which is where React got its name, is uh, your code reacting to state changes. So when your state changes, all of your declarations are in place, and your entire code base will react to data changing. Um, and finally, functional reactive programming, FRP, as you'll see it, is uh, using those functional blocks to achieve uh, reactive flow. So I know that was just a lot of words. Uh, now we'll see why those words matter, and then afterwards we'll see how to actually make something with all of those words. Um, so let's make some assertions here. Uh, you can agree with these. You can disagree with these. Uh, hopefully, throughout the rest of this presentation, I'll convince you to agree with them. Uh, but dogmatic design decisions can absolutely limit you in the way you program and what your code looks like in the end. Separations of concern, in my opinion, are your concern. You have to look at the needs of your application that you're building and decide where to draw the lines for your application. A lot of people uh, will say, oh, well, if it's not pure MVC, you're going to end up with bad code. You really need to follow these strict guidelines. Um, I think following a set of rules is important, but I think you should decide on those rules yourself. Uh, a lot of those dogmatic design decisions that people are very tied to uh, turn them off from React at first. Uh, you'll see some examples, especially when we talk about JSX, um, about why people immediately say, oh, I don't like that. That's not what I'm used to. But um, you know, try to be open-minded and see, all right, maybe there is a way that I can, I can code and, and make my own decisions about where to separate my concerns. Declarative programming helps manage complexity and state. Um, a lot of times when you're programming imperatively, you're saying, all right, now do this, now do this, now do this, 
now I've achieved a new state. You know, now an item is selected or something. When you're doing that, all of that imperative programming, you have to maintain in your head what the state is. When you're programming declaratively, you can say, all right, when that's supposed to be selected, all of these things are supposed to happen. It's a little bit easier to let your application kind of manage that, uh, that mental stress for you. Uh, and FRP uh, makes this very doable. It makes programming declaratively uh, much more natural. And uh, by reacting to state changes, you can keep your source of truth in one place. This is what I was talking about earlier with never having to go to the DOM to check something. Who, uh, who here uses Angular? Lots of people. Uh, how many of you use two-way data binding when you're writing Angular? A little, a little bit less, but still a lot of you. Has that ever caused you headache not knowing where your source of truth was in your data. Yeah, I see, I see a couple heads nodding, so at least some people agree with me. But uh, with React, you have a source of truth kind of at the top of your reactive flow, and that's where everything else gets da its data. You never have to worry about, all right, is the DOM the truth? Is the JavaScript the truth? Is it this component that has it? Is it this component that has it? Um, so kind of this reactive data flow is really important to keeping things simple. Uh, a lot of React is, is keeping things simple for you. All right, so this is kind of the de facto intro to React example, is uh, a list with some list items and some data inside of them. Uh, so let's take, for example, the React track for today. Uh, when you go to break this down, into something reusable. So you want reusable components. You don't want to sit there and copy and paste uh, a piece of uh, a DOM fragment six times. That's not good programming. You, you want to write it once and have it react to your data. So we can kind of break this down into two major components. A larger uh, parent list, or list component and then a list item component that you can reuse. So that, that should be pretty simple to, to reason about. Um, now let's, let's look at how to build this. But before we get there, as I mentioned, we need to talk about what is a React component, and we need to talk about a little bit uh, some ES6 so that you can kind of reason about the code because that's how things are done now. So what is a component? Uh, it is a functional building block. Uh, that's, that's the most important way to think about it, um, especially with the newest version of React. Components don't have to be classes like we'll see in a second. They can actually be pure JavaScript functions. Put an input, you get an output. Um, so that, that's really the most important thing to think about these is uh, very similar to functional programming, you have all of these functions that you can string together, you can list, and then you can map, and then you can reduce, and all of a sudden you, you have a new thing that, that's wonderful for you. That, that's kind of, Re React tries to take that to UI. Um, so each component uh, has to contain a declaration of its output. Uh, the way React does this is something called JSX. This is what most people don't like when they first see React. Uh, and what JSX is, is it is a markup-like syntax that you drop directly into your JavaScript. So when a lot of people learn MVC, they learn, all right, I'm going to have my, my template here, this describes my markup, and I'm going to have my logic here, and this describes my logic, usually broken up controller or, or view controller, or, you know million different thoughts on that, but the way React does it is they say, all right, the logic that belongs to this UI state should be right next to each other because they, they belong together. One is directly affecting the other. If I want this to be a composable component, it needs to be fenced in with itself. So you have your markup directly inside your JavaScript which is a little weird, and you can immediately escape out of your, your markup and start just writing pure JavaScript. Uh, we'll see some code examples in a second. A lot of people don't like that, but uh, 
I think if you kind of are open to the idea and try writing some JSX and writing your components this way, it'll immediately become clear kind of why it just makes a little bit more sense. And now, uh, as of two, three, three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, uh, they, React components are officially ES6 classes or pure functions. Um, and each one of these classes has a render function, which is where you put that, that JSX declaration. So the, uh, the two most important kind of moving parts to understand within these, uh, these classes is that each component is going to maintain an internal state. It's going to just, it's, it's just a key value pair um, that is uh, Im immutable in its own right, but there is a set state function that comes out of the box with, with the component that you can call to change your state. And when that, when you call that set state method with new data to add to your immutable state uh, key value pair hash, it will immediately tell the virtual DOM, hey, the data has changed, re-rendered, you know, do your, do your diffing that I was talking about earlier, find out what needs to be pushed to the DOM or to and the Android view or whatever it is. So that, that's really key is to know that each individual component maintains its own state. As well, each component can receive props properties from its parent component. So I was talking about how they're composable. You would have you would have a, a list item inside of a list. So that list item can receive data from its parent list via the the props variable that that is going to have. Um, an intelligent use of props can kind of minimize the use of state. Uh, and there's a huge push right now, especially in React with this most recent uh, release that I've been talking about that now um, supports ES6 uh, as the default uh, method for writing your code. There's now a big push to try to remove state almost entirely from most of your components. Because as I've been talking about, React is about simplifying the process of your UI and, and reasoning about your data. So having a lot of different components with a lot of different state, just it's more mental strain. It's more to think about. It's, it's more to, to maintain. But if you can intelligently have some components that are going to hold all of your state and other components that are just going to receive data down the waterfall from that, that parent component that maintains the state, it's all of a sudden a lot easier to reason about. You don't need to have a full class, a full ES6 class for some components. You can just have a function. It'll get data, it'll give you a new UI output. Um, so that, that's a big push, but either way, the, the important thing to know is that every component can maintain its own state and it can use that state to provide its children with new data. So right before we jump into some code examples, uh, I do need to go over this because uh, how many of you have been writing ES6 or ES2015? Not, yeah, not a whole lot of you. How many of you are familiar with some of the concepts in the spec? How many of you have been looking into it, getting ready for it? All right, that's a, that's a better number. All right. So uh, I just grabbed a few that are com commonly used uh, in React components, and I, I use them in, in my example. So uh, I wanted to walk through them. Uh, one thing I, I should mention before we, we jump into that is uh, as of this most recent release, you are no longer using a standalone uh, compilation uh, library. There, there used to be a, a file called jsxtransformer.js that would take your, your React components, bundle them up, change your, your JSX, which is your markup, change that into executable DOM manipulation functions. That doesn't exist anymore. Now you just use the Babel compiler, which is uh, one of the most popular ES6 or ES7 to ES5 compilers out there. Uh, they came out with uh, JSX support 
and React said, you know what, we want people to use ES6 anyway, so we're going to deprecate our function and we're just going to use you. Um, so now if you're writing React, you also just have ES6 functionality out of the box, uh, which I think was a good move on their part. So let's look at, uh, can, can you see that? Maybe I should make it a little bigger. Um, so one of the first things I've been talking about is ES6 classes. Uh, how many of you have, have written a language that, that supports uh, classes as first class citizens? Not JavaScript, really. Okay, a good number of you. Then this should be uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, you can have a, a class declaration. It can extend another class, which means it, it can adopt all of its, uh, all of its functionality. You have a constructor. This gets called when you instantiate your class. This super function just means, all right, also call a constructor of my parent. Um, and here you can kind of set variables onto the, the instance of the class. I'm going to set some string to a string. From there, you can have getters and setters. This way, when I say, you know, my class dot loud string, it would take some string and turn it into uppercase and return it as if it were uh, its own variable, um, and then you can put functions on the class. In ES5, it would, in, I, I chose to go with uh, the React create class function, but one of the best things about ES6 is uh, treating classes as first class citizens because there are so many libraries out there for trying to recreate class functionality or trying to use ES5 uh, prototypical inheritance and it's, just so frustrating. This is what something like that would have looked like in React before, but now we have a much cleaner uh, first class standard for it. Fat arrow functions, uh, these are very similar to CoffeeScript fat arrow functions. Uh, if you've ever used CoffeeScript before, um, the big thing other than just the shorthand is a little bit nicer to read, is it's going to automatically bind this to whatever this of uh, outside of the scope of the function declaration is. So in ES5, you would, you know, if you said var that equals this, and then inside you tried to compare the two, no, this would be bound to the scope of this, uh, this unnamed function. With fat arrow functions, this inside the function is already going to be bound to this outside. Um, and then you can also get implicit returns. If it's one line, you don't have to put it inside brackets and say return. You can just put it in parentheses. Um, and then the last thing uh, to walk through is uh, map. Now, the array uh, prototype has map functionality, which means it will loop through every single item in the array and run some manipulation on it and return it as a new array. Um, so you can just say my array equals one, two, three, four, map it, run to string on it, and you'll get an array of strings. Uh, in ES5, you would have had to create an array and then uh, push all of your new values onto it, or just use lodash or underscore. Um, so those are just some things I wanted you to be familiar with. If you're looking at React code now, you're going to see those three especially very heavily used, so you should be familiar with them. Okay, now let's jump into some code. Are there any questions so far? Yes? Yeah, uh, you mentioned that um, the emphasis was on the view of the model view controller. Um, what are you, if you're programming React, what are you using for your model? So, uh, yeah, we. I should have addressed that earlier. So there's a lot of different, kind of React's whole thought process is they wanted to build a strong UI component library that can be dropped into whatever system you kind of need. So they, when they first released it, they thought, all right, people will start taking Backbone and ripping out the view layer and just using Backbone models, which are observable which is really nice for React because you want to be able to react to data changes. So you can just observe when the model changes and then call set state yourself. 
uh, that was kind of the most popular way to use React right when it first came out, was to, to do it with Backbone or something like that, or CanJS was really popular as well. Um, from there, they, they released uh, a data architecture, not a library, called Flux, uh, which Andrew Smith, right after me, will be talking about if you want to hear about Flux. Uh, and it's kind of their answer to MVC. They saw a lot of problems with, you know, oh, spaghetti code, and I never know where my logic should live. Uh, so they kind of, as I was talking about earlier, redrew their lines and said, this is how we want our data stores to act. This is how we want our data manipulation declarations to act. This is how we want our view to interact with those two pieces. They released that. Tons of implementations out there on GitHub. If you read Hacker News, it's hard, very hard to avoid new Flux implementations. Uh, so finally, Facebook, just uh, a few weeks ago, released their, um, their new full framework that uses React. Uh, and it's called Relay, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. But uh, really, React's whole point is you can use something out of the box that Facebook provides or that someone else releases on GitHub. Or you can just take the reactive UI component and use it with existing code or whatever you're familiar with or whatever fits your need. Any other questions before I move on? Cool. Um, okay. So let's look at... Um, all right. Let's look at... Uh, kind of a basic implementation of what I just showed you. Can everyone see this, or is this not at all big enough? Okay. Uh, yeah, so what if I do... Hmm, those are still in the way. Is that all right? This is so frustrating. Uh, is that better? All right. Um, all right. Got it. So, uh, just like that, that little class example we had looked at earlier, uh, what we're going to implement that that um, that list in those those list items. So that is two components that we're going to need. One is a list. It's just a, a parent container for those list items. All it has is a title and the list of items. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing you need to make a React component valid uh, within the class is a render function. You need to say, and here's the UI that I came up with based on other things. Uh, so this is just a very basic example. I expand on it uh, in the next slide, uh, but we're just going to have some data. Uh, it's just going to be uh, a regular JavaScript collection of uh, KV pairs with the title, the speaker, and the time. So me, this, now, and some others. <sighs> So from there, now we're going to return JSX. Uh, this is the part that people that don't use React say, oh no, I hate that. Why, you know, why is the data right next to the markup? That should be separate, that should be a template. Um, but when you kind of look at it as just a declarative fenced off piece, you can say, oh, well, actually it is pretty nice to be able to just use a curly brace, escape my... Uh, escape my markup, and say, all right, now return these list items. You can treat a component exactly like any other HTML5 node or element, um, which is really kind of, when, when you start to think about it, you know, oh, I guess that's not so bad. You know, I don't have to context switch with, you know, ng loop, and then I go over into my into my controller and I say, all right, let's define this directive and this is what this means and you know, it's just right there. It's, it's very obvious, it's pure JavaScript. Uh, they're not adding a whole lot of overhead to looping over anything. Looping isn't a first class citizen. 
you just use underscore dot map or array dot prototype dot map. Um, so in ES5, this would have been something a, a little more implicit, but you know we we can just it's a one liner in ES6, which is really nice. So we're going to go to the data, map over it, take each piece, and then we're going to return a list item. And I was talking about props earlier. This is how you pass down a prop exactly like any other attribute in, a, in, uh, in HTML5. So I think this kind of familiar uh, scheme for, for declaring uh, pieces of your UI is really, really nice. You know, this isn't something new to learn. It just looks like HTML5 that you can write yourself. Um, from there, each list item is going to receive that that uh, that piece of data that we passed as um, item data as an attribute. It's going to receive it in the this dot props variable. So each one of these DOM nodes inside of it, we're just going to escape the JSX and implicitly return this.props.itemData.title. Very simple. Uh, and then also you can have helper functions on the class, uh, like humanize string. So if the data, oh man, this is frustrating. I'm sorry. If the data, uh, you know, says just 10, and then we want to humanize that and turn it into 10 a.m., we could have a string and I didn't actually implement it, but you could have something like that. Um, so are, are there any questions about this example? Uh, yes? So, so would I be right if I said that JSX is more like a domain-specific language rather than yes. a markup? Yeah. So, it's, this, so, you know, so whatever is being returned by render, that would be compiled by Babel or something. Yes. Yeah, so if there was an error, it would show up like like, like, a, like a error or yeah, that's exactly what it does. So it, it really is exactly, as you said, a, a DSL that is also 100% backwards compatible with HTML5. Yeah, they, they, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. So it is its own language definition, and when you run that through Babel, it's going to take each line and it's going to come up with a JavaScript function that manipulates the DOM to achieve that declarative state that, that you put down. So it's going to say, all right, next node, I'm going to need a div, and it's going to need a class with the name list item. Also, uh, class is a reserved word. You have to use class name in JSX. Little thing. Um, so it's going to do that, and then next time you re-render, it's going to say, hey, React, what's the best way to achieve this new state? It's going to look back at the, the JSX declaration, and it's going to say, oh, now I need a div there with the class name, you know, foo. I don't know what that button is. Okay. It, it's going to, uh, to say, all right, now I need the class name foo. One of the intelligent things React does is it's not actually going to remove the div list item and paint a new div with the class name foo, it's just going to change the class name on foo because it's a quicker operation. So that's how uh, kind of this domain-specific language translates to a much faster repainting process. Um, and in a second, I'll talk about how state changes affect repainting different subtrees, uh, and you also get more performance gains there. Yes? I'm just curious. Does Babel understand JSX natively, or is there some plugin? Uh, now, at this point, if you're using the most recent Babel, it just knows to look for JSX. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, there are also plugins that you, especially for Relay, which is that uh, that framework I was talking about earlier. There's a Babel specific plugin for for transforming JSX when you're writing Relay specifically. Um, so. But yeah, it, it was originally introduced as a plugin, but now I think it's just a flag in Babel. Um, when you're using Webpack, you don't even really have to think about it. So this is transformed into the virtual DOM? 
this gets transformed transformed into a set of manipulations that the virtual DOM can use to know what to paint into the real DOM. So the virtual DOM is really just a mirrored representation that's a lot faster. It doesn't have to go ask the browser and to go in and check it, this data. It can just say, oh, I already have that in memory. I already have that in JavaScript. You never have to leave JavaScript land to do these intelligent diffs, uh, which is really the magic of it. And then React will say, all right, how do I resolve the virtual DOM with the existing DOM, the, the real true DOM? Back there. FYI, there's a full screen button just below the slide navigation. Really? Yeah. Right oh, look at that. Perfect. <laughs> um, yes? Is this logicless, or uh, how, how would I go ahead and do some sort of like comparison in the template in JSX? So if I wanted to check whether title is equal to something, sure. render something else. Yeah, so when, when you escape with curly braces, you are escaping into just JavaScript. So I could say this.props.itemdata.title equals equals, you know, intro to React, and it would say true in, in the title field. Or I can, you know, use a ternary and say if it's intro to React, display something else. Display best presentation ever. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, can't you also break those out from inline and instead of being inside the render function, have the function sit inside of the class and then just call the function? Yes. There? Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, and a lot of people do prefer to do that to clean up their JSX because th they want their JSX to look a little cleaner, more like a template. Can you repeat the Yeah, so he had asked if uh, inside of these, instead of just dropping in JavaScript, if you could drop in like a helper function, which is really kind of what this is. Um, but you know, you would say, you know, this dot get speaker, this dot get title, uh, and then you can have that living as another function on the class. And then that that's also really nice because let's say the name of the property changes, you don't have to go dig through your JSX to find every use of that property. Uh, you've abstracted that away to using uh, a helper function, so you could just go change it in the helper function. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, so now, Excuse me. yes. So the same thing applies. I can take out that whole render block and put it in a function. Like, it doesn't have to be within there, right? Um, so the render function actually does have to be a function named render that returns your UI. But if you want to have the render function simply be a wrapper that returns the return value of some other function, that's fine. You just need to have a render function that returns JSX. Cool. Alright, so this is completely stateless. This is just taking some data, painting some stuff to the DOM, passing some data to, to his children, and rendering those children who also paint to the DOM. Now let's incorporate some state, which means the component is going to hold on to a piece of data and say, alright, now before I paint, let me look at this data and evaluate what my state is so I know how to return data. So uh, in this one, I am adding the ability to add on to the list. Let's say someone called up Pratik 10 minutes ago and said, oh, I have a great React talk. You need to include it. I said, all right, let me get tired on it. He'll add state to the components. So to do that, you define your state in the constructor. This is different from previous versions of React where you actually had a function called get initial state. You had all of these lifecycle functions that you could hook into. Do this before the component renders. Do this, uh, you know, check this to see if it should render. Call this to get the initial state. All of that's wiped out and been replaced by a kind of more functional ES6 uh, focused methodologies. So. Now, to define your initial state, you just simply save a, uh, an object onto the state variable. 
so I'm just going to define my data. It has the existing um, the existing collection. So far, nothing really looks different other than oh, I added a button, and on click, which is just simply an attribute, uh, React actually re-implemented -imp the uh, HTML5 vending system. I'm going to add uh, an on-click handler. When that happens, I'm just going to create a new item, uh, reacting with React by George P. Burdell. Go Jackets. Um, and then I'm going to take that new data, push it onto an array. The cool thing with state is that it's immutable. When you do push, you're just going to get a new object. Uh, you're going to get the return value. It's not actually going to mutate the state. And then here I'm calling update data. The reason I made add data different from update data is uh, what we were talking about earlier with, you know, it's kind of, you want to be agnostic of whatever your, your data store system is. So I wanted to have this separate so that something else could say, uh, update the data when this observable changes or, you know, maybe remove a, a talk or something like that. So I, I made them two separate functions. Now when you hit the button on click, it will add a new item. Um, and we can actually see that here. So we have our, our title and we have all of our all of our pieces, and let's say we want to add an item. When we click add item, it looks at that on click handler, creates the new item, pushes it to the state, calls set state, and the second set state gets called, it will say, all right, let's put the new state onto the state variable, and then I'm going to go look at the virtual DOM and see what needs to change now that I have this new data. Click add item, and immediately it re-renders. You don't have to do anything about oh now go add this new this new node to the dom and then change the class and you know do this dom selector to find the title and then paint this into the title it just does it it says all right i'm going to react to that that state change paints it in there so now let's add some state to the uh yes Sorry, I don't know if you're going to get to this, but, like, how did you get to this button? Like, what did you do? How did I what? Like, how did you get that set up? Like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about Webpack in a second. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to kind of focus on the, the internals of a React component, but I, I have some slides at the end that we'll have to power through quickly. It's 10.53. Yes? So, with the new phase of state, uh, were you only able to use that state without invoking set state within the constructor? I uh... I say that one more. Oh yeah, yeah. Only in the constructor before I uh, kind of all of everything is is stood up. State doesn't exist, and it's really just a uh, kind of a blank canvas. Okay. You can paint directly onto state. Once the component is mounted, which is the term it uses for, it is linked up to some DOM nodes in the DOM. Once it's mounted, state is immutable. It will fire a warning if you try to mutate state directly. You have to call set state. Um, and you can call component.isMounted to check and see if it's married to any DOM nodes. All right, real quick. Uh, so I'm actually going to skip over this because it's really just another example of the same thing. I, you can change the color. You can favorite it. If you click on it, it changes a variable in the state. It'll say, all right, now uh, for the style, you're going to get a background color. If state.favorited is true, it will use gold. Otherwise, it uses initial. Um, so that, that just accomplishes this and the nice thing about this is when you click this and the state of the list item changes it only looks at the list item and its subtree everything uh, from the node with the class list item and below it's going to uh, diff and see if anything needs to change 
when you actually add that item, it's going to start at the parent component and fan down in a search and say, does anything below me need to change? But the nice thing is it still does the repainting all at once. So even though this is a much smaller diff than adding an item, repainting to the DOM takes about the same amount of time. It's a much flatter time with React because everything is done in React or in, uh, in JavaScript and then painting to the DOM is done intelligently by the framework rather than by uh, an, an imperative piece of code. Uh, so I think I'm about out of time, but I can power through a few more what it gets me if you're interested. I do want to talk through these really quickly. Uh, a few popular things going on right now uh, is actually painting your styles in JavaScript and letting React turn them into inline styles on elements. This seems weird. Another separation of concern, difference of opinion. Uh, you know, that, that should live in CSS, and this should live in a template, and this should live in, in JavaScript. Uh, I've written CSS in JavaScript. I've written CSS in JavaScript. Uh, it's very nice to have this programmatic control over your over your styles. Kind of gets rid of that global namespacing issue. It it you know allows you to not have to pre-process things. It's processing styles on the fly, just like it's processing structure on the fly. Uh, it's really nice. There's this great framework called Radium that's brilliant. Uh, if you want to check that out, I would suggest it. You get Webpack hot reloading. Uh, which I can show you an example of. This is called, uh, or you know, the color is, is gray. If we go into our source and we change the color to orange, I hit save. I hit save. And then I go back here. Well, no. Hey, everything's orange. I didn't reload anything. It just reactively updated to my actual source files changing, which is cool. Uh, power through these really quickly. Flux is what I was talking about earlier. It's the one-way data flow. If you're interested in it, Andrew's giving a talk in about 30 seconds. Uh, relay. That uh, is a very, very cool library that just came out. Netflix has a competing uh, technology called Falcor that's also awesome if you're interested in that. Uh, basically, the way it works is it looks at all of the data that you define in your components that you're going to use. It builds a structure for that data, and it goes to the server and says, hey, to render this view, I'm going to need this data. Give that to me from the server so you don't have to worry about REST endpoints and writing endpoints that you know are extensible and you can build on you can just leave it up to the library to figure out what data you need and to go get it from the server. It's really cool. Uh, React Native, instead of painting to the DOM, you can paint to iOS and Android. And Immutable JS, or Immutable Integration is really great for this if you've ever used an immutable library like Mori or Immutable JS. Uh, React works really brilliantly with these immutable libraries, so I would check them out. Uh, the code is on my GitHub account, and I'll put these slides up. Um, and we're out of time, sorry.